So today we're going to be t continue to talk about the infinite degree of system, freedom system, uh, for a piezoelectric uh, material uh, with an applied alternating electric field. And as we know, as a result, it's going to vibrate. And we define the middle as zero, and we define a, a spatial coordinate system x, where we had the maximum coordinate as Lx, L over 2, and the minimum coordinate as negative L over 2, which makes for L as the length, and also the thickness. We discussed and we found the response of this system uh, with regards to the spatial displacement. Displacement is U, and the spatial coordinate is X, and uh, we calculated last time uh, the following expression. So now we're going to kind of go into explaining what these uh, parameters mean. So we'll go over this first parameter. And this first parameter is basically telling us that the displacement is proportional to the d constant, which we know more a higher d constant, a higher displacement. You know, remember we read in the DC term, we saw this relationship. So we increase the d, we're going to increase, generally we're going to increase the displacement the strain and increase the electric field, generally we're also going to increase the displacement. But since we're talking about alternating electric field, this is an equation which relates and is more relevant uh, toward, um, uh, toward the DC analysis if you want to determine displacement from it. Uh, but since we're going AC, uh, we still nonetheless see the fact that it's proportional to this term. The next term we see is K, 1 over K. So K is equal to the frequency divided by uh, the point, the s speed of sound, which is related to one over square root of rho s, and depending on how you apply these electrodes, you'll use a different s here. If you apply the electrodes on the side, which I s showed here, so you're applying the thickness is also the length, then you have a uh, dielectric permittivity, or sorry, elastic compliance under constant dielectric displacement, which is going to be um, a lower uh, frequency. It's going to be a lower um, compliance because it's more stiff. Or you will see a uh, uh, elastic compliance under constant electric field if the if the electrodes are applied on top and bottom. And we'll go into why exactly that is uh, in a few lectures down the road. But just know that they're, depending on which side you apply the electrodes, you're going to have to use a different compliance, a different material property. But anyways, so this is a pretty much a constant number, though, because uh, your electrode configuration is the same. Uh, so, but, so we generally, we tend to see the fact that as we increase the frequency, uh, we're going to be increasing the K. And in this equation, if you increase the K, so K increase, UX decrease generally we see from this term so this kind of helps us what would help us understand this term is we have uh, the mass spring damper system but we're not going to use a damper because we're not damping the system here so we're applying a force to some mass spring damper and this is a real this is a only a real uh, uh, spring constant so there's no losses so we'll see uh, let's call this displacement u and we'll call this frequency and we have, we'll have resonant frequency right here. So we'll have the displacement go to infinity at the resonance frequency. And then as you keep increasing your frequency, you'll get to zero. Remember I mentioned as you keep shaking this extremely fast, the material, the mass can't respond anymore. So therefore, the displacement goes down to zero at infinite, infinite frequency. Similarly, if we increase the f uh, frequency to infinity, uh, we won't be getting, we'll be getting a zero from this term. Uh, now we'll discuss um, this bottom term here. So this bottom term, uh, I'm going to claim that it's going to reflect the resonance frequencies. It's going to tell us what the resonance frequency is. And unlike a single degree of uh, freedom system, uh, a infinite or multi-degree of freedom system has multiple resonant frequencies. So I'm telling you that when this cosine becomes zero, if this if this portion becomes zero, then obviously one any number divided by zero equals infinity, which is a resonant frequency, where we have infinite displacement under a situation where we have no losses. We'll consider losses uh, shortly in the future. 
So cosine of let's say alpha, if cosine of alpha equals zero, then we have a resonant frequency. This leads us to a resonant frequency. So how does the cosine of alpha equal zero? Alpha must be pi over two. This is a simple trigonometry relationship. Plus and pi. Because we have a cosine here. You remember that you have it be here, here, here. You know, it's, it's just defining all those terms which are separated by pi, but start at pi over two. So, in this case, n equals zero is the first resonant frequency. You can write f1. n equals one is the second resonant frequency. Uh, you could I'll, I'll pretty much alter this if you just put a, a minus pi over two, then n equals one would be the first resonant frequency. Uh, but it doesn't make a difference. So this alpha was one half k over one half k l equals alpha, which equals pi over two plus n pi. So basically, you remember I remember k is equal to omega over the sound velocity. So if we rearrange these equations, we can get the following. And I'll just put minus here now. So n equals 1 can be the first resonant frequency. So this would be 2 divided by L V equals omega n. And each of these n's is going to be resonant frequency. So we're going to see if we kind of drew a displacement plot. And we'll draw u, let's say, at L over 2, approximately. And this is a uh, frequency. We'll have frequency 1, frequency 2, frequency 3, dot, 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 frequency infinity. So as we see, we start from this point where this is the DC, the DC response. We go up to infinity and down. And then we see another response up to infinity and down. We go up to infinity and down. And remember, I, I told you about this k term right here. As this, as we go to infinity, this k term is going to make this whole equation zero. So both of them are fighting. The resonant frequencies are fighting to increase the frequency, increase the displacement, and the non-resonant frequencies are are. I mean, in that k term, that one over k term is struggling to destroy it. So basically, you're going to see a smaller response uh, out at the off resonance points. But as soon as you get back to resonance, you're going to get back to infinity. So it's going to be something like that. So eventually, this will get lower. Well, after you respond to this frequency, it'll get lower and get lower and get lower, uh, if you kind of understand. But basically, the response is going to look like this. Multiple resonant frequencies, multiple points where the uh, displacement can go to infinity for a system with no losses. Next, we're going to talk about this term, sine kx. And I'm going to say, that sine k x is the displacement shape or displacement profile. All of these were just telling us the amplitude. This whole, all this stuff over here just tells us the amplitude, but this tells us the shape. Uh, if you want to look at a non-dimensional, or you want you know you want to tell the shape of it. For example, if we have two two sine functions, well, let's say we have a function like this, and we have a function like this. Both of these are both of these are sines. They both have the same shape. They both have the same profile, but they have different amplitudes, right? And the amplitudes are again. They're governed by these equations over here. This part of the equation is governs the amplitude, and this part of the equation governs the shape. So now let's take a look at the sine x term. Sine k, which is uh, omega over um, sine velocity x. So if we basically kind of examine a sine term in general, uh, we're going to have 0 at 0. So we have maximum here. OK. 
Okay, drawing the best sign curve I can. So this term right here is going to tell us the period. So when omega is very small, let's say much less than uh, v, or the sound velocity, um, this period is going to be really long. So basically, um, kx, kl, we'll call it kl, because kl, is the whole, KL over 2 is the domain, the edges. Basically, the, the biggest part of the profile we're going to get is KL 1 over 2. So, um, if we want to determine the profile, we go uh, KL over 2 is going to be the maximum point. So, KL over 2, if K is really, really small, uh, because omega is much less than uh, uh, the sound velocity, uh, we're just going to have, we're just going to have this portion right here. So only the small area, and we'll assume this this part is a k l over two, and a negative k l over two. So if we blow it up, basically, we're gonna get a profile like this. And this what this is profile? This is a DC strain, or low frequency. But let's say we start increasing this k effectively we're going to be increasing what it looks like over here until we reach this point and at this point what happens k is the max this this, this uh, is uh, the maximum point and this also this corresponds with the reverse resonance frequency see this point right here this this uh, n equals one uh, over here this will correspond with the same exact point as this when this uh, hits the maximum. So this is also, this becomes a resonant frequency. So the first resonance frequency uh, actually looks like this. It's like a sine wave, but it looks like that. So we have almost flat edges at the, at the edges of the sample, L over 2. And this is also L over 2 over here. Uh, but we don't have uh, this straight line anymore, we have this sine curve. So as we are increasing the frequency, we're sort of increasing this width but it's but everything's being scaled properly because we have this L over 2 kind of scaling us and kind of telling us what we need to consider. So as we increase the frequency, this is kind of pushed out. And then when we get to this point right here, we get to the second resonance frequency. This is omega 2 because this is minus plus or minus L over 2, right? We use plus or minus L over 2. That's why we have it on this side and we have it on this side. So the second resonance frequency, so I showed the first one as looking like this. Uh, the DC one was just a straight line. The second resonant frequency looks like this. So we start from the bottom. Let's start from the bottom, or it doesn't make a difference too much. We start from the bottom, we go up, we go down, we go up, like that. And these are all like uh, uh, the same amplitude, these heights. So we have this type of resonance effect. And then if you go to the third, we'll have even more curvy stuff going on there. If we go to the third one, we'll have this and this. So pretty much, uh, what, what happens as we increase the frequency, the shape, the normalized amplitude. The normalized amplitude is the maximum amplitude divided by, I mean, the amplitude divided by the maximum amplitude, which is always, most of the time, going to be occurring at the edge. Um, so this is going to slowly shift from, uh, as we increase the frequency, from frequency DC to frequency 1 to frequency 2 we're going to slowly be shifting from this to this, so it'll start to get curved as we increase the first resonant frequency this goes there, this goes there, and then, then we're actually going to end up here like this. And this is the amplitude of the displacement and this is the relative position.